Thanks very much for coming out, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here and seeing this event. My name is Andrew Lawton from The Andrew Lawton Show here on 980 CFPL in London. And now you can hold your applause, it's fine. And I had the great privilege of speaking at what was one of the inaugural events of this organization, the screening of the Red Pill last year. And it was a tremendous event. It was taking place across the hall where the, I think the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario was speaking. So there are gonna be potentially some really confused people in here in half an hour or some really confused people in there if they went to the wrong event. But uh, I, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping we've already done the natural cleansing of, of where everyone wants to be. The Red Pill screening was an eye-opening experience for me as, as a London broadcaster because after I, I did that event and there were pictures and selfies and all of these great initiatives that came out of that, there was a coordinated effort against my company from people that said, how dare you go and speak, how dare you let him go and speak at that event? And it was interesting because not one of the people that was raising concerns had seen the movie. They had all done what so many people have done with organizations like CAFE and other groups with a similar mandate, which is that they hear one tweet, they read one thing on Reddit, and all of a sudden they're an expert on it. And I think there's never been a more important time to have the discussions that are being had in this room tonight. So I'm very pleased that we're gonna have a, a very great speaker coming up in a few moments, Karen Strawn. That's gonna be a tremendous opportunity for us all. She's come a, a very long way. So let's give her a round of applause before we get into it. When we talk about issues not being able to be discussed, I, I'm gonna share a little bit in a moment about my own approach to this and, and my struggle with mental illness, but I wanted to share something that actually just came up a few days ago serendipitously. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Christina Hoff Summers, but she's from the American Enterprise Institute. She's a, a tremendous scholar, and she has been put on a report about male supremacy hate groups that came out by the Southern Poverty Law Center Me too. in the last week. You were there too. Well, let, a round of applause for that one. That's, that's quite an honor on there. And, and the report didn't list her as being the head of a hate group, but it said that she, and I'm going to read a quote here, gives mainstream and a respectable face to MRA concerns, to men's rights activist concerns. And the fact that you can all of a sudden have, again, people that haven't listened to a speech by Karen, people that haven't watched one of her videos, people that haven't read any of Christina's work, which interestingly enough has been honored by feminist groups in many cases, all of a sudden say, well, she's a male supremacist. It's not about supremacy, it's about equality. So I'm very grateful to be here tonight at this event and supporting the work that this great local charitable organization undergoes. I am a survivor of a suicide attempt. And I suppose that's a weird sentence because no one can say that they aren't a survivor of a suicide attempt. But what I can tell you is that I've gone through for many years of my life struggles with mental illness and depression specifically that ultimately led almost eight years ago to me trying to find my one-way ticket out of the world. And I'm one of the people that was very fortunate. I had access to a family support system. I had access to a lot of great care afterwards. But I know that a lot of people don't. And I know that specifically a lot of men and boys don't. And one of the things that I saw when I started dealing with my own issues, which really started as a teenager and, and went into adulthood, was that there was this moment where a male turns 18, or in some cases 19, 20, depending on the region, and they're thrust out into the world, there's no support, there are no services available, and the ones that are there are overburdened and very difficult to get into. And it's not to say that women don't experience the same things, but that's the whole point about this. We're not talking about taking away access to support, we're talking about adding, we're talking about equality. <coughs> and my struggle with mental illness and my struggle with depression and my struggle surviving a suicide attempt was compounded by the fact that there is a fundamental reality facing men a lot more than other demographic groups, a lot more than women, and that is the expectation of toughness, the expectation of not being able to be vulnerable, not being able to be weak. And for some people, and I don't consider myself a particularly strong person, it's really challenging. It is really challenging to navigate the world when you are going through something that is tormenting your brain in ways that a lot of people can't imagine if they haven't gone through it, and you don't know where you can turn. And this was eight years ago. The pendulum has started to swing a little bit in the other way, and now one of the things that everyone loves doing is talking about mental illness. We have a lot more discussions about it. One of the things that I've spoken about is that you have now initiatives and days and ribbon campaigns almost every month of the year for mental illness. You've got World Suicide Prevention Day, Mental Illness Week, another Mental Illness Week. You've got Diagnosis Specific Days. You've got all of these. I would list them, but we'd be here all day. But that talk needs to be met with action. 
And I think when we talk about the mental illness issue, it's important to understand what some of those underlying concerns are. It's not just about throwing money at the problem. It's not just about having more access to care and more doctors. It's about dealing with the root conversations in society. And one of those, not the only one, but one of those is the way that men and boys can navigate that. And I'm a man who's standing up here who's experienced that firsthand, and I'm very grateful there are people, a lot of people in this room, that are wanting to deal with that challenge. So I want to thank everyone for coming out. It's going to be a great evening. First, I'd like to welcome up to the stage the Chair of the Board of Directors for CAFE, Mr. Robert Samry. Well, thanks very much. I, I uh, want to bring up my notes here. Um, it's a real honor for me to, number one, be here in London with the CAFE group that has done an enormous amount in London to bring attention <laughs> to boys and men's issues. Uh, before they got here, there were a few people scattered that talked about boys and men's issues from an egalitarian, from an equality perspective, but it hadn't been organized, certainly not as well as the current group of, uh, of people from CAFE have done now. So congratulations to all the people that have been involved so far. If you haven't been involved and think you might like to be, then Jim Brown might be the first person you want to talk to and get involved here. And after this talk tonight, uh, you may be inspired to, uh, to, to, to do that. Um, but it's also a double pleasure because I got to drive Karen in, which meant that I had her captive in my car for <laughs> as long as I could keep her there. So we drove really, really slowly. So out I, into the bushes, into a secluded <laughs> place with no people, no. <laughs> and we had, we had a, great, uh, a great conversation in the car, and I'm looking forward to another one on the way back. And uh, she has a perspective on almost everything that is unique, considered, and eye-opening. Um, I expect that her talk tonight is going to be no less. Uh, she has been invited to a number of, a lot of speaking engagements throughout Canada, the United States, and most recently in Australia, where she was invited to a very large conference that the Australian uh, uh, men's groups put on. Uh, it was broadcast throughout the world and for good reason. And Karen's talk was one of the highlights there, and I urge you to, uh, to listen to it if you can. Um, she mainly speaks about <coughs> boys and men's issues uh, from a perspective of how boys and men are how boys and men are negatively affected or even denigrated in being boys and men. Um, more positively put, though, how we can help boys and men reach an equality status that they currently don't have um, that is woefully missed, and we just heard some examples about how that uh, th that happens. Um, in mental health. And that's what Karen is going to talk about tonight. I don't know what she's going to say, but I can promise you that it's going to be very exciting and you will learn a great deal. Karen. So uh, first thing I want to say, uh, just to re reiterate uh, Dr. Brown's point earlier when he came up um, and give a suggestion for people. Uh, I have a few uh, people who support my channel uh, through monthly small PayPal donations. It's actually really easy to set up from one PayPal account to another to throw $2 in the hat every single month on a schedule. So if you have a PayPal account, that's an option. That's something a lot of people don't really think of doing, but you can absolutely do that. So, um, and like he said, we don't need giant sums of money. Well, I mean, not all of us. Um, apparently, uh, some of us do the giant sums of money. Um, okay, so one of the first things that I want to uh, make clear is that uh, I'm I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. And therefore, I don't really feel uh, qualified to speak on the kinds of diagnosable mental illnesses that are uh, organic and heritable, um, things like bipolar disorder and uh, schizophrenia and, uh, and those types of, of problems. Um, 
Um, so what I'm, and, but mental health is, is a huge, huge, broad constellation of related topics. It's not just about the things that you would go to a psychiatrist and get a prescription for. Um, it's about, uh, it, it's kind of like regular health care. Um, you have illnesses that you inherit um, or that you inherit a predisposition for. You have illnesses that you catch that are contagious. And there are also areas of health care that deal specifically with injury. And one of the biggest tragedies, I think, in uh, Canada and most of the Western world is that so many of the mental health issues that are faced by men cannot be considered to be uh, mental illness in the uh, in the way you generally think of it, as in uh, some place you would you would be sent someplace for treatment over over a long period of time with maybe drugs and and stuff like that. Uh, I would actually call them psychological injuries. Um, that that's really where a lot of this comes from is from psychological injury. And uh, so I want you guys to imagine uh, uh, two pebbles, and, and you've got one in each hand, and you're dropping them from, from a helicopter. And you drop one r r above a forest canopy. And as it descends, its acceleration gets interrupted by leaves and branches. It bounces from one to the next. Its trajectory is diverted, even reversed. Um, and at some point, it might reach the ground, but it might find itself in a tangle of leaves and foliage. And uh, then I want you to imagine that you drop the second one above a canyon, and it's a wide open, empty space. And uh, as it falls, it accelerates, and there's nothing that's going to stop it from hitting the ground. The longer it falls interrupted, the harder it's going to hit and the more devastating the impact's going to be. And uh, when it comes to the problems that people face in their daily lives that cause them psychological injury, um, and when it comes to the, the things around them that can act it, as that canopy of leaves and foliage um, that get in the way get in, in the way between the pebble and the ground. Uh, the first situation is more common uh, for women in terms of society's response to when they enter into a crisis. And the second one is, uh, is more common for men when problems pull them down. Um, women have, uh, are more likely to have strong networks of friends, family, and acquaintances. Uh, those friends, family, and acquaintances will uh, be more familiar with the signs of trouble, with the ways women express their problems, with the fact that women express their problems and that they need help. Um, they aren't going to necessarily understand the warning signs uh, coming from a lot of men. Um, they have co-workers, co-workers, bosses. Um, who often will show uh, a lot of compassion if, if they start showing up late for work, if they show those warning signs, if they are unenthusiastic, if they appear to be um, unmotivated at the job, right? Those are potential interveners and people who can help them get, get help. Um, healthcare professionals, uh, they screen women. When you go in as a woman for an appointment, they will ask you how your mental health is. They will ask you how you're feeling in your life. And I don't know that, they, that there's much of an effort to do that for men or to ask them in a way that would, uh, would make most men want to feel like opening up. Um, they have, uh, for more severe, you know, when the, that pebble's reaching the ground, they have shelters and crisis counselors and social workers and teams of people um, who maybe there aren't enough of them for every woman that needs them, but they are there um, often specifically for women. And uh, all of those people can slow or even halt that trajectory of that pebble or throw it back up into the air and get it back where it wants to be. 
The situation for men is more likely to involve few to no interruptions. There is no thick canopy of foliage in their path to catch them. They are less likely to have those strong familial bonds. Um, and in fact, in some of the situations where men are most in need of those, that is when their families and friends will often uh, not be there for them, intentionally not be there for them. Um, crisis lines are manned by volunteers, often reading off of a script that they're not allowed to deviate from. Um, and that script is largely based on women's psychology, on the way women process their emotions and express them. Um, do men are less likely to see the doctor for any reason whatsoever, and they're less likely to be asked about their mental health, about how they're feeling psychologically. Um, the service is available to mitigate uh, the material problems that might be causing or exacerbating a crisis situation. So the loss of a job, the loss of a home, um, you know, finding yourself couch surfing, uh, the loss of your family. Um, those, uh, those material problems, there's not a whole lot of help out there for men. There's help out there for women, specifically for women, in those situations that does not exist for men. Um, and I won't need to explain to the audience that the culture at large and its institutions tend to have a deficit of compassion for men and boys in general, and that deficit follows them when they enter their period of crisis. Um, one of the most interesting uh, things that I uh, saw was a study that they did uh, where they surveyed psychologists, professional psychologists, and asked them, they showed them, they, re they had a series of vignettes of spouses in conflict. And, and one of the spouses was always someone who could be categorized as abusive, and the other a victim. And they randomly switched the genders. And psychologists were 50% more likely to label any scenario of, as abusive if it was the man doing it to the woman than the other way around. This is a deep, deep bias, even amongst our healthcare professionals. Um, so, and sadly, this deficit exists in other men, um, and in men toward themselves, I think. So, is it any wonder men are more likely to commit suicide than women, to succeed at it? Um, I was in Grand Prairie not long ago. Uh, I was stuck in a blizzard in an Airbnb 45 minutes out of town, and I showed up as a gigantic 12-foot head on the stage glaring down at the other panelists who were like tiny. It was actually quite, going back and watching it, I felt rather godlike. Um, but uh, I, was, I was Skyping in, I couldn't see anybody. Um, but at the Q&A was Tom Matty. Uh, he's a friend of mine and uh, he's the person from whom I shamelessly poached that uh, pebble metaphor. Uh, and I will thank him later with a drink or something. Um, and uh, there was a woman there from the local rape crisis center who, um, although she talked some sense, she said Erin Pitsy was ridiculous and that made me not like her right away. Um, in the midst of the opening remarks, uh, another woman actually, and I didn't find out who, what had happened until later because I couldn't see anything. Um, she worked at the local domestic violence shelter, Odyssey House. Uh, she stood up and grabbed the mic and climbed up on the stage and kind of uh, just owned the stage. She just, she just took over. She thought she, it was, she thought she was one of the panelists. And she was there to tell us all that Odyssey House helps men too. And that she and other feminists feel attacked by people like me um, and people like Cafe. And a male volunteer from that shelter also piped up uh, that he had given men hotel vouchers when they had come to the shelter, abused men and male victims. And that in the past, they had even flown male victims from Grand Prairie down to Strathmore, 100 kilometers east of Calgary, uh, to the one shelter in the province that has two beds available for men. And uh, these are fem feminists. They are well acquainted with <laughs> toxic masculinity 
and all of its little narratives and negative expressions, and uh, they know them. They can list them off to you. Men, men don't seek help. Men don't express their emotions. Men don't talk about their feelings. Men do everything they can to avoid being seen as feminine. It is known, Khaleesi, men are all these things. Yet, on Odyssey House's About page, what do we see? Odyssey House is a nonprofit organization and registered charity. We provide safe, secure, and supportive accommodation for women and their children who are victims of domestic violence, are in crisis, or in need of a housing alternative. Odyssey House is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We accommodated 464 women and 217 children in our emergency shelter and 19 women and 33 children to our second stage shelter during the fiscal 2016-2017 year. We took 3,370 calls to our crisis lines last year. Our trauma counselors worked with 63 individuals from December 1st, 2016 to March 31st, 2017. No men there. No men there. Okay, and uh, you know, okay, let's go back. Let's go back to the list. Men don't seek help. Men don't express their emotions. Men don't talk about their feelings. Men do everything they can do to avoid being seen as feminine. Like maybe calling a women's shelter for help. Now the handful of men Odyssey House has helped over the last couple of years reached out to them despite the fact that this house bills itself as only offering services for women. How dire must those men's circumstances have been to have picked up the phone and called a women's shelter to ask them if maybe if they even knew of somebody who could help them. I want you to imagine you're a guy at a mall, and please don't take this as a salacious thing because it's, it's not. You want to buy some underwear for yourself. And you walk past an underwear store, and the sign above the entrance includes, this, uh, includes a stylized woman in a pink bra. The mannequins in the windows are all women in various fancy undergarments. Inside, you see rack after rack of bras, panties, corsets, bustiers, garter belts, stockings, cool pantyhose, as well as practical everyday women's underwear, lounging pants, sports bras, tank tops, pajamas, and yoga pants. Now even if you're the kind of guy who wouldn't feel one speck of embarrassment walking into that store, are you going to do it on the off chance that maybe on some rack in the very back they might have some underpants for you? I don't think you're going to do that, right? So this is just being practical, right? Why would you assume that what is obviously a women's store has any underwear for you? And even if you're the kind of guy, right? who would not feel embarrassed phoning a women's shelter or feel embarrassed saying I've been a victim of my spouse and I need help. Why would you think Odyssey House has anything for you? Why would you think it's worth the time and effort to call? The very people operating these shelters that bill themselves as only serving women, right? They say that men don't seek help but they also won't say, we have help for you. Why not? I can't stress the importance of outreach and advertising enough. Uh, my significant other, Mike, volunteered at a crisis line in Edmonton when he was in university. And one of the first things he suggested that they do was uh, post cheap eight and a half by 11 posters with those little tear off tags with the phone numbers. Super, super cheap. Put them on bulletin boards in drugstores, on event boards, anywhere where you put, I have a cat for sale, you know, or a sofa, anywhere. Just put them up everywhere. Um, they said, uh, feeling overwhelmed, like there's no light at the end of the tunnel, you're not alone, and we're here to listen. And uh, they tripled their calls over the next two months. So that's the power of actually telling people that you have a service for them. And it's clear to me that we need to do better, um, particularly places that are willing to help men need to do better letting men know that they have help for them. Um, we need to do better in providing accessible help to men in crisis, and we need to do better in helping them, and this is the really important thing, in helping them avoid crisis in the first place. 
Um, so I'm not here today to talk about abnormal psychology. I'm here to talk about psychological injury. Um, the situational mental health issues faced by otherwise ordinary, previously functional men, the men whose emotional turmoil is not uh, is a not irrational response to the things that are happening to them. Um, and often these things, uh, they can find themselves in these situations through no fault of their own. Um, so I'm going to talk about my significant other again because it's easy because I know all of his history and I can rattle it off. Um, when his previous relationship ended, uh, he sat on a bridge for about five hours and thought about jumping off until a homeless man wandered by and talked him down. Uh, he had been with his ex for a little over five years um, and when he started seeing her, when he got with her, she had a five-month-old daughter and uh, that was his daughter, became his daughter over the five and a half years or so. Um, from before this little girl could crawl to the day she, day after, well, till after she had entered kindergarten. Um, he was her daddy. She called him daddy. And uh, at the encouragement of his ex, um, and this happens to a lot of men, uh, most of his previous guy friendships ended up neglected in favor of couples friendships, right? Those to do couples things with our couples friends, with the friends that both of us like and want to spend time with. Uh, couples friends add to the relationship and guy friends take away from it. So, so when she left him, what happened was what typically happens. She got the kid, <coughs> the, uh, the lodgings, and, uh, and all of their mutual friends. And uh, she told her friends what she wanted to tell them about what had happened, uh, why they weren't together anymore. And that was that. And he found himself without the woman that he had intended to be with for the rest of his life, uh, with, uh, without the child he considered his daughter in every single meaningful way. And pretty much everyone he'd actively been friends with for more than five years. All of that was no longer accessible to him. Um, he spoke to two lawyers regarding his parental rights and options, and uh, he was told that he essentially had none. Um, the very system that would happily, and his lawyers told him this too, would hold him responsible for child support solely on the basis that he had taken on a fatherly role with this girl, would do nothing to uphold any kind of custody or guardianship privileges based on that role. So they said, don't even take her to court for custody because you won't get it. You'll just get a child support obligation. A couple of their friends who tried to maintain ties for a month, month or two, uh, they, they backed away eventually. They said it was just too awkward being friends with both of them. Uh, they felt they were being put in the middle of something difficult. And they didn't like the way he talked about what had happened because, I think because it made them feel differently about their friend. Um, because she really did pull a number on him. Even their pastor, uh, who had mentored him when he and his ex were together, essentially stopped answering his calls. So when the two of them split up, she got the, the house, the kid, the friends, and even the church. Um, the expectation, and here's where it really gets awful, seemed to be that he should just be able to go on, just be able to move on uh, from the breakup without leaning on any of the people he believed were his friends and with whom he had cultivated supportive relationships while he'd been with his ex. Um, it was actually portrayed as mean of him to try to take her friends away. Um, when he heard through the grapevine a year after the breakup that his ex had told their daughter, whom she hadn't allowed him to see for several months, and was no, never going to allow him to see again, that he was the one who had made the decision to sever contact. Uh, she told her daughter, he just wants to do his own thing. Sometimes grown-ups need to do their own thing. 
uh, he spiraled back into depression, despair, and suicidal thoughts. I mean, not seeing his daughter was not his decision. The realization that his little girl had been asking to see him and uh, been told by her mother that he just wasn't interested. Um, and him being unable to tell her otherwise, I can only imagine what that must have been like for him. And the fact that he understood at that point that if he had so much as emailed this girl's mother, she could have accused him of stalking. So divorced men have rates of death 70 to 100% higher than those who remain married and rates of suicide uh, about 10 times higher than women who are divorced. Um, Tom Maddy, who has been through his own personal hell, put it to me this way. Uh, if you were working a crisis line and someone called and said, I've just become homeless, you would consider them at risk to harm themselves. If someone called and said, I've just lost my kids, you'd consider them at risk if they said, I've just lost half my savings and my income, you would consider them at risk. If you said, I just, if, if they said, I just lost my wife, you'd consider them at risk. Um, men routinely lose all of these things, all in one fell swoop, by a mediated settlement or a judge's decision or just what their lawyer tells them they have available. And uh, somehow despite the fact that mental health professionals know that any one of these things can send a person into uh, suicidal depression, uh, we believe this is something that's perfectly fine to do to human beings. All of that in one fell swoop. If these men are lucky, they will end up in line for triage and treatment often for wounds that they shouldn't have sustained in the first place. Wounds the system was complicit in inflicting, and uh, paid professionals and unpaid volunteers will listen to them talk about their feelings about the problem, but will rarely have anything, any power to help them remedy the problem in the first place. Um, coming to terms with a loss is a suboptimal outcome compared with not experiencing that loss in the first place. I hope that we can all wrap our heads around that, but this is pretty much the most our system is prepared to give a lot of men, and in a lot of cases, it's not even willing to give them that much. Um, so basically what we're doing is we're kneecapping men and then sometimes offering them physiotherapy. Um, According to the Canadian Medical Association Journal in 2014, nearly half of the homeless men in Toronto, a population where mental health problems are ubiquitous, have a history of at least one traumatic brain injury. Did you know that? Um, of these men, 66% reported brain injuries associated with assault or domestic abuse. 42% with motor vehicle accidents, and 42% with sport or recreational injuries. 73% of those with a history of brain trauma reported that their first injury happened during childhood. So these men are injured, and it's not their fault that they necessarily can't manage to cope with life without help. Um, Ontario's trauma registry indicates that about 90% of all the people who sustain a traumatic brain injury due to an assault are male. And this is the type of brain injury most strongly associated with ending up homeless. This is something that could be avoided. Um, this isn't expensive research. You, uh, it doesn't involve biopsies or scans or double-blind drug trials. Um, it just involves going to a homeless shelter and asking the men there about their history of bonking their heads. Um, or having their heads bonked by others. And, and yet, we're not doing this. this. This was the only study I could find on this, was the one done in Toronto. We can do better. 
We can do better with men. We can do better in preventing them from having these experiences in the first place that send them into mental health crises. We can help better help detect those men who are in need of help by actually tailoring our approach to the way men process and express their emotions. Um, well, tailoring, it, tailoring one of our approaches to the way men do that. Uh, we can stop falsely gendering uh, these problems uh, of things like domestic assault as being unique to women. Um, our responses to people in crisis need to actually fit the people, not the, not the institution. And we need to look at the real reason men succeed at suicide more often, despite women attempting it more. And it's not because men are more violent and uh, therefore choose more lethal methods. That's really not that consistent. It's true in the United States, uh, where there's lots of guns around. But it's not necessarily true in Canada or the UK or any of these other Western countries where men commit suicide three to four times more often than women do. It's because men are less likely to find people or institutions who can provide them with actual solutions to their actual problems. Men are not the people who swallow a bottle of pills and then phone someone who's going to send an ambulance. When they hit that point, they usually know that nobody's going to send the ambulance. So we need to look at this. Um, we need to look at the real reason why men lash out violently sometimes when they are despairing or desperate. Um, you know, it's amazing that we will, we will look at women who will defend their children. Um, they will stand there and they will, they will fight to the bitter end to do what they believe is keeping their children safe um, because, and keeping their children with them because that is what that entails. And yet when men get angry at losing custody of their children, they're seen as a danger. And when they, and when they, one of the things that's the most amazing thing is the, a lot of the very first instances of domestic violence occur during the breakup. There was no violence before, but you tell a man, yeah, I'm taking everything away from you. The house, the assets, the car, the kids, you know, your, your money, right? Everything, I'm taking it all away from you. You know, that, that's when men are gonna snap, right? Especially if they've been through something that's difficult, like, you know, so I mean, men aren't perfect. And we need to realize that, that men have ways of expressing and processing their emotions that are just a little bit different from women, hashtag not all. Um, so why would a man swallow a bottle of sleeping pills? Why would a man, and then phone, phone for, you know, for help, when, I mean, it, it took a homeless guy to talk my boyfriend down off a bridge. Homeless guy wandering by, right? None of the cars driving by, call anybody, no, a homeless guy. So we need to think, rethink the whole thing. We need to rethink the entire thing. And I'm wondering if maybe screening in doctor's offices would be a start. And I think, I definitely think that places like Odyssey House, um, they need to change their website. They need to actually say, well, you can't stay here, but we can help you. Right, because this is, we're just not doing enough, and it's just so sad. And frankly, we need to do some more in the work of, you know, getting fairness in family court, getting due process back into the law in domestic violence cases and things like that, so that you don't find men trapped in a system where they're the victim, but they're being treated as the perpetrator. I mean, these are, these are easy, easy things to avoid doing to people. And, uh, and we just don't seem to have the political will to actually stop doing them. So I guess that's all I have to say. Um, and uh, I would welcome any questions if you have them.
All right, not that this thing is on, apparently. Is it? No, it's not. All right, it's not. All right, I can yell. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we uh, are going to take questions, as Karen said. Uh, the one, uh, I'm the whip cracker, unfortunately. Uh, the one rule that I've always had at events like this is that uh, a question, the first sentence should end with a question mark, and the second one shouldn't exist. So that's the way that we'll try to get as many of your questions in as possible. But uh, yeah, throw up your hand if you have anything you'd like to ask. Yes? Sure. Uh, Trudeau had this recent quote, <clears throat> when women speak up, it's our responsibility to listen, and more importantly, to believe. Any suggestions on how we can fix that? Send him on another trip to India to embarrass himself, and maybe people will stop. Will will not elect him next time. I'm I'm just that man. Like <laughs> okay, I don't know what people were thinking when they elected him. They were thinking, oh my god, he just has such nice hair, right? It, it's anyhow. Um, that whole thing, that's sort of, uh, did, was that quote from before or after the Weinstein Harvey one? Sure. It's a fairly recent, after Weinstein. After Weinstein. After Weinstein. Yeah, I mean, he's jumping on that bandwagon and <laughs> things are gonna eventually, um, I think there's gonna be enough pushback eventually that, uh, I mean, all it's gonna take in, in that Me Too thing is for a few more, Aziz Ansari style accusations and a few uh, demonstrably false ones uh, to to come up. Well, I, I'm being hopeful. I'm being optimistic. I'm hoping that it's not like um, the satanic panic. It doesn't turn out like that, where you have hundreds of people prosecuted and then you realize, oh wait, it was all bullshit um, and based on nothing. So, um, but yeah, I don't I don't know how to other than voting him out. Uh, there's no talking sense to somebody like that. And I actually just saw a, uh, a photo of, uh, it was a news story, CBC, I believe, um, Maggie Trudeau denouncing all of the abuse and bullying that her son has been suffering um, from people who are criticizing his behavior. So I, I'm just, I, okay. Um, you're a public figure, you're gonna get some criticism, and plus you do really stupid things. So yeah, I, I don't I don't know the answer to that other than I'm just hoping that things calm down eventually. The, the fact that there is a pushback and that people, because during the satanic panic, um, anyone who actually expressed any doubt whatsoever in the stories of those children. And I don't know if you're all familiar with that, but I mean, these kids were telling stories about, uh, one of them told a story about how his daycare provider anally raped him with a kitchen knife while he was tied to a tree in front of the daycare in broad daylight while passers-by just walked by and did nothing. And there were no physical injuries that they found on this kid. And that guy was prosecuted over that. Um, so, like, it, believe the children, children do not lie. That was absolutely 100, and anybody who expressed any doubt was immediately fired from their job or, or denounced in the media, or they were called a pedophile enabler or, or whatever. So, I mean, we have voices speaking up, right, that were not there during the satanic panic when it comes to Me Too, so maybe there's hope, so. Yes. Well, I mean, that's a process that's been going on for a while. I mean, like, if even if I go by my own experiences back in 2010, um, if I suggested to a feminist that uh, <coughs> men were, that a significant minority, if not, you know, an equal number of men, uh, that, that it was not insignificant. If I suggested that to a feminist, she would immediately just shut down. She'd be like, no, 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 no. Uh, male victims are infinitesimally rare. 
Um, they almost, so rare as to almost not exist. And, um, and it's still, uh, I couldn't find a feminist who would say anything different. And now increasingly what feminists are doing is, oh, well of course men are victims, we knew it all along, right? Um, so they're starting to do that. And uh, they may not be, uh, but I mean like I, I'm one of those people and I told uh, a radio show host in Ottawa when I was here for the Ottawa um, thing uh, a couple of years ago, um, she said, well, you know, you have to realize that women are still the vast majority of victims. And I said, I'm not going to be pulled into a debate over statistics here, right? You would agree with me. I have no doubt that one woman raped is one too many, right? Well, I think that one man turned away from domestic violence services because he's the wrong gender, right? That's one too many too. And being the majority of the victims does not justify a monopoly on services. And that's really where we need to be now, because now they're starting to admit that there are male victims out there, that they're not infinitesimally rare. There may be debate around whether it's 20% of victims, 30%, 40%, half, whatever. They may argue over, maybe there's some disparate impact there on individuals, you know, maybe it hurts women more than it hurts men, which is actually toxic masculinity there. Um, but. Uh, you, you, we're, we're beyond the point of arguing that male victims exist now. We've actually managed to force them into a corner where they cannot continue to spew bullshit about how it just doesn't happen. So we just need to keep going and keep going and we're going to see change. And, and maybe, maybe because one of the audience members in that panel discussion berated both of those workers for saying, you know, you have to advertise. Right? How are we supposed to know that you help men and you come in here and you're all on your high horse about how well we do help men, you know, don't blame us, we help well. How, how are we supposed to know you do? You don't tell anybody. So. Yes. Yes, uh, I'd like to give you, Andrew, as well as uh, Karen, something later on. So please don't leave without seeing me first. Mm -hmm. uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, let's just say that yes. Is it going to be a large sum of money? Uh, <laughs> to be honest, million dollars. Yes. All right, excellent. Okay. So we'll first, first okay. Uh, I'm formerly uh, an owner of a business, mm -hmm. but we'll leave it at that. Uh, I dealt with many, many people, and I realized that yes, men are definitely stereotyped. Yes, I know victims. And yes, I know different people that victims of suicide. Uh, it's very sad, and what's going on in today's day and age. Uh, what I like to say though is uh, I job shadowed with a lawyer before my own self personally got the insight within the courtroom and family law mm -hmm. and uh, I got to say that I overheard the stuff that was going on and they did not know that I was just job shadowing that I thought I worked with the lawyer firm but I'll, re I'll leave that out uh, I'm not from originally London area uh, but however that uh, I like to say that yes I did some statistics and 75 percent of women programs and services you got a special day like Independence Day for women or whatever, and you had walked Victoria Park recently. Yeah, so anyways, we see all this here funding for these women groups. Uh, yes, men are silent. Men are has macho. They don't want to say, they don't speak up. But there are a very, let's say, of 25% of men. Uh, there's maybe 5% of men or whatever that really does need help. What I'd like to ask and say, and your que like my question, I'm mm -hmm. listening for an answer if anybody knows. Uh, if the government was to have equality for both men and women, could there be funny issues that hinders the equal equalization between both genders? Perhaps? How would that work? Well, are, are you talking about the pie is only so big? That's the question. Yeah, it shouldn't be that way, but it sounds like it because there's only so much funding. Like, let's say the child custody and the... Are you, just, are you saying just funding for men and women programs are be exactly equal? Yeah, yeah pr pretty well close to equal, like for both. Uh, equal services for both. Well, well I, I want to get the answer there. Right? Equal yeah. accessibility, I think, is what we're going for. And, you know, one of the things that I uh, have <coughs> talked about in the past is that, I mean, we it's entirely possible. I mean, we don't know at this point because we've never tried it, but it's entirely possible that if we built an equal number of domestic violence shelters for men that they'd only be half full right because of the way men 
might choose to seek help differently or to uh, maybe <laughs> feel like they wanted, they would rather have a hotel voucher or they would rather get out on their own. Um, you know, they might not want to feel dependent on, on a domestic violence shelter. So, um, or dependent in that way. So, I mean, what we're talking about is not necessarily 100% equal funding across the board. Um, what, one of the things though too is, when I was on Reddit years and years ago, and I wish I could find this comment again, because it was somebody who actually, uh, he said he was a bean counter in Alberta, um, in the Alberta government. And uh, he was put to the task of determining how much money is spent on gender specific programs every year in Alberta. And the number for women, uh, in this provincial money, the number for women was more than 50 million for the year, and the number for men was 57,000 and change. And uh, that, that was, and maybe Earl Silverman's one time grant of $800 was in that 57,000. Um, that, you know, the one guy in Calgary who ran a shelter out of his own home, out of his own pocket, and uh, all he could get from the government was 800 bucks one time. So I really think, to be honest, like... It, like Sorry, we just want to move to some other yeah, questions here, but Karen will be around at the end. Uh, was, it, was it you or one in the front row that had one? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't really have a question, but I, was, I, I guess part of my comment would relate to the, the whole idea of the fact that we also have a large number of men on the street mm -hmm. that have been affected by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Yes. And, and that's really serious. Oh yeah, no, and, and the courts will do everything to protect a mother's right to drink during her pregnancy. Um, I remember a case, I think it was in Saskatchewan. Uh, sorry? I didn't hear the comment, they didn't hear the comment. Oh, the, repeat the comment. Oh, the number of uh, men on the street who are victims of fetal alcohol syndrome. So, um, but there was a case in Saskatchewan where a, a woman was abusing drugs and she had abused drugs through four previous pregnancies and her children had been taken into care and the judge uh, ordered her to stop using drugs and stop drinking for her fifth pregnancy and he was overruled by the appeal court. So um, you, you can't tell a woman what to do with her body. You can only deal with the carnage that she leaves afterwards. So, um, and the government pays for that. So. Maybe uh, focusing on, on uh, nitpicking, but um, you commented on the fact that there, the reason why men tend to be more successful when it comes to suicide is not because they tend to choose more violent, but because they lack the services. Well, because they mean it. They yeah, really mean it. exactly. Uh, do you really think that those are the only two options, or are, are there other reasons behind it? I mean, what kind of I'm statistics sure and stuff it's, do you have to back it? It's very, very rare that you're going to see a difference that doesn't, doesn't have more than one reason, a d difference on, on that kind of level. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of uh, suicide attempts are cries for help. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're insincere attempts. Um, sometimes they're successful because uh, there was a miscalculation, but a lot of the time uh, that young woman swallowing the bottle of pills and picking up the phone is wanting, is intending to be rescued, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I think that most men uh, would not see that as an option. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe they wouldn't want it as an option because, or in their minds at that time, I'm sure afterwards they after they survive, they might feel differently, but in their minds at that time, I think they're more likely to be in that place where they see no other option. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think honestly, and the way, the way a lot of uh, men are treated when they actually do show their vulnerability, um, it, it really is uh, that kind of, uh, I mean, some men in the situation that my boyfriend was in with his ex. Uh, now, I, I hate to think that his mother would do this, um, but I, I just, I can't, I know there are women who have done this. I know women who have done this, that they will choose 
the X over their own son because the X gives them access to the grandchild, right? And uh, so, I mean, the, the level of abandonment in some of these men's lives is just absolutely catastrophic. And uh, so, I mean, honestly, I think it's not necessarily, um, you know, the deficit in services. It, it is a deficit in intervention at all levels. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Karen, I think that MGTOW mm -hmm. is a healthy response to exactly what's happening in our society. Do well, it's a rational one. It's definitely a rational red, one. Red pills will keep men alive. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't think MGTOW's for everybody. Like, I, I don't think it's for every guy. Um, there are men out there who can be perfectly happy just doing their own thing and not getting into relationships or not into serious ones. Um, and, you know, I have my job, I have my career, I have my, my hobbies, I, I travel, you know, I do what I want to do. Um, but there, I think there are other men out there who, I, I know one of them, he actually got into the men's <clears throat> movement out of anger that uh, he, he said to me, you know, when all the other kids and I were playing when we were kids and they were like, I'm gonna be a policeman and I'm gonna be a fireman and I'm gonna be a astronaut and a race car driver and all that. He said, you know what I wanted to be? A husband and father. That was, that was, I, I wasn't dreaming about being a race car driver. I wanted to get married and have kids. That's what I wanted. And I'm living in a, I am aware enough of the situation that I can't, I can't let myself do that. And so my dream, my life, right, the life I planned, the life I wanted, right, that, the opportunity to do that and not incur all of these risks, right, that's been taken from me. So uh, that's, what, that's why he got involved. And I don't think MGTOW is necessarily healthy for him. I think it's a rational decision but I don't think for him it's necessarily the most emotionally healthy one, so. Uh, yes. Um, how can we as individuals make ourselves more accessible to the men in our life knowing that they've been sort of molded societally to not speak about their problems? Like, is there a way to make ourselves more accessible that's not pushy or that doesn't seem <laughs> well, see, I'm one of those, I'm one, the weird woman out here because I can't get my guy to stop talking about his feelings half the time. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm the quiet one in the relationship, and he's always asking me what, what's going on in my head. Um, believe it or not, I don't talk like this in my normal life all the time, right? Like, I, I'm quite quiet. But um, I think, honestly, there, there are a few tricks that you can do, and one of them is... Um, small bites, right? Um, and, uh, you know, don't necessarily dance around the issue, but uh, don't push, like, bring it up, but then don't push, right? And then you just say, well, you know, when you, if, if you want to talk, it's fine. Um, sometimes I've found that sitting side by side rather than facing each other is actually a way that men feel more comfortable talking about about things that, that are bothering them. And uh, maybe not sitting in front of the TV, per se, but, um, but yeah, the, the eye contact, I think, because men process eye contact differently than women do too, right? So um, it's, uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's a tough one, it really is. And I think, honestly, just don't be judgmental. And whatever you do, if he doesn't wanna talk, don't yell, you never talk about your feelings, and, and get like shrill like that because he's just not gonna open up to you. And quiet voice, right? Like just being, you know, sort of calm and quiet. Uh, yes, at the back. Okay. So you talk a lot about um, you know, uh, emergency intervention. Of course, we need uh, domestic violence sh shelters for men. This would be a very good start. Um, I live in Windsor, we have this exact same thing, our hiatus house only serves women, etc. But um, I'm curious as to what you think we should do for boys. Um, what interventions would you like to see there? Because I have my own ideas, but... 
Oh, okay, that's kind of a tough one because I think people are gonna, that's a conundrum, right? Because what we're doing right now is we're doing a bait and switch with our boys, right? Um, we are telling them uh, your feelings matter just as much as girls. We're teaching them girl behavior and girl responses to problems and uh, like tattling and uh, you know any any kind of, kind of conflict on the playground you know with, between two kids go tell an adult right have your conflict mediated right um it's okay to cry all of these things right and then they hit 16 17 they get their adam's apple voice cracks sprout a bit of peach fuzz all of that changes right and they were raised like it's kind of like a turtle without a shell or they've had their shell ripped off. They were wearing a shell artificially, now it's ripped off and everything's just, they don't have any calluses. Um, so, like society, I guess, is gonna have to make a decision as to like, okay, do we raise boys as if they're girls with equal compassion and equal attentiveness and equal coddling and all of that. And then when they're adults, we give them the same compassion we give women or do we go back to toughening our boys up a little bit so that they're ready when the male tears coffee mugs come out, right? So, but I don't know the answer to that question. I, I essentially, um, I approach raising my boys in a kind of a raised by wolves style of parenting. So, I mean, they did a lot of free play in nature, a lot of just doing their own thing, a lot of unstructured time, um, a lot of, face planting off of scooters and, and things like that. And like, hopefully that has prepared them for, you know, and a lot of wrestling with each other and letting them fight, yes. right? So, and now the older one is really regretting it because uh, my older boy is 23 and he's 5'11 and my younger one is 15 and 6'2. <laughs> so the tables have turned. Yeah, we got one more. Um, I was wondering, uh, from personal experience here, because um, I was told I hit all the criteria for PTSD, mm -hmm. but I was also told, I don't think you suffered enough to actually have that diagnosis. So how much do you think is a gender issue when it comes to diagnosis, even for mental health, to get through? So the person who would be homeless, they're like, oh, he just has depression, might actually have a more serious diagnosis, and we're just like, it's just a guy, he's just well, I think, I think you're right there. I mean, like, I was actually talking with uh, a uh, military veteran. Um, I think it was at ICMI 14 um, in Detroit. And he said that when he was in uh, a VA hospital with post-traumatic stress disorder, the nurses there acted like he was faking it, like he was just being a big baby. And, uh, and I'm thinking, this is a veterans hospital. This is like, this is not the place to think that people are faking it. Um, so yeah, I think there is a lot of that. I think that that sort of, that dichotomy uh, or that difference, disparity in how psychologists <coughs> responded on that survey, thinking that, um, you know, the man was being, if it was a man, he was being abusive to his wife. But if it was a woman, she was not being abusive to her husband. Um, I think that that really colors everything. Like it's it's indicative of the same thing. You should have been tougher. You should have not been traumatized by that. You're a man, you know, and uh, and so obviously you don't have that because a man wouldn't have gotten it from that, right? So, in your remarks, you mentioned male violence, and I was just wondering if you could expand upon that a little bit because I know that what you said there is the kind of thing that would be skewed by a lot of people as saying you're justifying violence, but, I was, but I've heard you speak about that before, and I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about that when you talk about men expressing themselves. Well, I mean, when you, it's when you corner an animal that it's going to attack you, right? And, when, and we are animals, that's, that's what we are, and we operate on instinct, and so when you, when you corner a man, and particularly when you're being provocative, when you are provoking. So, I mean, we're not just talking about uh, she's filed for divorce and, you know, calmly asked him to move out. 
we're talking a lot of these situations where that first instance of domestic violence happens during the breakup are these epic end of the relationship fights where where she's screaming at him and poking at him and she's up in his face and she's calling him every name in the book and then uh, then he and then she says oh and you're never going to see your kids again right and there's going to be a response to that a lot of the time. Not every man is perfectly in control of himself 100% of the time, no matter what you do to him, right? And so I think we need to have some compassion for men who are driven over the edge, even if it's not, even if we say it's not okay. Just like we have compassion for a mother who loses her temper and spanks her child, right? And then feels like maybe that was not the right thing to do. Um, you know, you have compassion for people who, who aren't perfect, so. All right, we've got time for two more. We'll go there. Um, hi, uh, Megan. Um, so why do you think um, when it comes to the court system, we have this deeply, like, biased root against men when it comes to, like, sexual assault allegations, domestic abuse, it always ends up being, you know, the men are wrong no matter what the situation goes. It's, like, 95% of the time it usually goes into the woman's favor. Our compulsion to protect women is, is not new, right? It's, it's very, very, very old. And it's a compulsion on the part of men, and it's a compulsion on the part of broader society. So, um, and women have it too. When, like, we just generally are more concerned with the safety of women. So when you have two people, right, and one of them is saying, he harmed me seriously, and the other one is saying, no, I didn't, and you have to pick which one you believe, there's, a, there's an instinct to err on the side of caution. And when you're prioritizing the safety of women, the side of caution is not going to be, you know, uh, it believing him, right? Or respecting due process or, you know, all, all, any of those things. It's going to be really this, uh, this urge to, to believe her and, and put him away so he can't harm any other women. So I think it really is deeply ingrained. It's, it's so, so, so old. It's, it's older than civilization. It's maybe older than humanity. So it's been there for a while. All right, sorry, we're trying to do, people that are asking our first question, uh, we got time for the last one there. Go ahead. Um, this just comes with like a quick little anecdote. Oh, um, I, when I was uh, in my early 20s, uh, I ended up, realizing that I'd been struggling with depression for quite a long time, um, shortly after being fired from a very, very stressful job. Um, it was actually the first time and only time thus far that I've called a suicide hotline. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in, in like I, I was at that point where it was just kind of, I have to call someone or I'm dead. Yeah. Um, over the next couple of years of working with my uh, doctor that had been working with me since I was, I don't know, two or three years old, um, I came to the realization that I needed to speak with uh, a therapist of some kind. And I suggested specifically um, one that was more familiar with, um, with working with men, mm -hmm. um, specifically because of the way that my brain works. Mm -hmm kind of just fits that better than a lot of the very, you know, touchy-feely, yeah. you know, talk about your emotions. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, and, I'm totally with you. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> kind of very rapidly came to the realization that we don't really have that. Yeah, I know, I know. It's so unfortunate. Um, this entire area of psychology of sort of tailoring uh, how you how you do therapy to uh, masculine uh, ways of being, um, because I would never want to be with a psychologist who's touchy feely and all of that stuff. I mean, like I could just eh, you can keep that. Um, I would rather yeah, talk about you know uh, talk about what can I do, right? Yeah. So it's it's just it's really unfortunate. And maybe Tom Golden uh, will be able to kickstart a. Uh, an actual sort of masculine psychology revolution. Um, I think that that would be great. You should. I don't know if you've watched any of his videos, uh, but I mean, he's he's just spot on when it comes to to the ways that men, not hashtag not all, 
um, deal with stuff like this. So, yeah. Yeah. Do, do you know if there's anything that uh, is out there that we can really sort of uh, bring to the attention of uh, you know, policymakers, uh, our MPs, so on and so forth? Uh, oh, you know what? I should. What we can do to foster more of that? I should probably talk to Jordan Peterson and ask him if he would be interested in uh, developing a set of courses on yeah. masculine psychology, um, you know, for clinical treatment. So, yeah, that would be, that might be good. And Karen will be around after if anyone has any private questions. We do have to move on, but thank you very much, Karen. Oh, move on. <laughs> And also kudos to Karen for getting through the whole thing without telling anyone to say people kind. That is, uh, <laughs> in a Q&A, apparently something that we... You know, usually when, I'm, when I say something, I'm just telling the audience to sit the fuck <laughs> <laughs> And if uh, Jordan Peterson does do the, uh, the masculine psychology okay. courses, let's hope he doesn't do what... I can't remember the school. There was a school in the U.S. that did a, a master's in masculinity. And the board of directors featured Gloria Steinem and Jane Fonda. Oh, that's at Stony Brook. Stony, yeah, so let's hope Gordon Peterson doesn't do that. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming out. Before we wrap things up, I want to welcome uh, Dr. James Brown uh, to the stage here. But I want to say as your MC, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. And here's Dr. Brown. Well, I'm personally very delighted by the, uh, the turnout we had. Excellent questions. But I'm here to thank Karen for doing a great job. I'm not surprised at all. Karen and I go back uh, a number of years, and uh, sometimes it's me in Edmonton, and sometimes it's Karen in Toronto, and sometimes it's Karen in Ottawa, and sometimes it's Karen in London. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you. We have, a, we have a few tokens of things that we want to present to you oh to thank you for what you've done for us this evening. Oh, um, and a thanks photo very much. Gee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> photo op. Is that pizza? <laughs> <laughs> it just, it's not hot like a pizza. It smells much better. All right. Here's me and my Laurel baby. <laughs> Um, my name is Darren, I'm the Executive Director of CAFE Western Ontario, and I want to thank everybody for coming out. I, this is a great turnout. Um, it's great to meet you, some I've talked to you, some I've emailed with you, and a lot of you are brand new faces I've never met you before. I invite you to talk to me inside or any one of our team. Um, and before you take off, if you haven't already filled out one of our surveys, we'd like you to do that, just to <coughs> kind of get an understanding of what topics are of interest to you, what matter to you. So we can look at getting some excellent talkers in, just like we have with Karen, um, to satisfy your curiosities. Thank you once again, everybody.